In this video, we will talk about what a probability measure is. So in sections 2.1 and 2.4, when we compute probability, so when we first talked about computing probability, we did so when we have equally likely outcomes. So equally likely outcomes. And when that was the case, I'm going to put an implication arrow, we had a formula for the probability of some event A occurring. And our formula for it was, we set up a fraction, and the numerator counts the number of elements in that event, the number of outcomes in that event A, and then we divide it by the number of elements in the sample space, the total number of possible outcomes. So where S is the sample space. Okay, I'm going to section this off. Okay, so in this chapter, in chapter 3, we are now going to try to compute probabilities. Compute probabilities in all scenarios. So in parentheses, I'm going to put hopefully. So as many scenarios as we can, hopefully. And a smiley face there. Okay, so even when the outcomes, even when the outcomes are not equally likely. So we want to develop a more general way of being able to compute probabilities. Okay, so let's look at an example. What's an example where we have a situation where the outcomes are not equally likely? All right, so the example I'm going to give here is suppose that a computer memory chip producer conducts an experiment where they check memory chips until they find a defective one, so that's one that's not working, or they have checked three chips. All righty, so if you need to take a minute or so to copy this down, definitely do. Definitely pause the video to do that. But let's get into this. So what I'm going to do is I want to label the different things that could happen at each check. So I'm going to let G represent, well, well, if I check the chip, and it's good. And I'm going to let D be if I check the chip, and it's defective. So if it's not working, if something's wrong with it. Okay, and now let's draw a, a tree diagram. So in the tree diagram, I'm going to draw a section for where we begin. And then potentially we will check a first chip. Uh, we'll do a second one and up to a third one. And after I have my third one, then we can write out what our outcomes are. All right, so this experiment says, well, you check a chip and either it's going to be good or defective, and you keep going until you find a defective one, or you've checked three chips. So let's say we begin, and when we begin, for the first chip, there are two outcomes. Either it's good, so I'll write a G, or it's defective, in which case I write D. Okay, and if it's a defective, we stop. Okay, so I'm going to just highlight that. A lot of the times in my tree diagrams, I like to just highlight or circle the points where I end up stopping. So from that D, I stop there. I don't need to draw any more sub-branches from that D. But if I did have a good one, I, I, I need to keep going. So I'll, I'll do a second chip. And the second one, well, either it's good or it's defective. And if it's defective, we stop. But if it's good, we keep going. And I'll draw two more branches. So we check a third chip. And either the third one is good or it's defective. And now, because we've checked three chips here, in both of these cases, we are going to stop. So I'm going to highlight these. Okay, so for my outcomes, let's see, we had GGG for the one at the top, all three goods. We also have GGD, so two goods and then a defective one. We could have also had GD, so that was if we had a good one first and then a defective second. And then finally, if we had just started off with a defective one, so D. So there are four outcomes and we can form 
power sample space. So our sample space, we can write out all the outcomes in a set. So I'll start with the smallest one, if it was a defective, or GD. We could also have GGD, or finally GGGD. All right, so that is our sample space right there. And if we just think about an experiment like this on an intuitive level, intuitively, we likely think that, you know, if this uh, memory chip producer is good at producing chips, that the probability of getting a defective one, so like for this first outcome, is probably going to be pretty low. Like, ideally, they want to be very low probability that they make defective chips. And if that probability is low, all these outcomes are not going to be equally likely. So intuitively, we think these outcomes are not equally likely. So e.g., for example, as we were saying, the probability of the outcome D, the very first chip being defective, is probably very low. So it wouldn't be unreasonable for it to even be less than 1%. So our goal is that we want a way to assign probabilities. We want a way to assign probabilities to events, even when the outcomes are not equally likely, even when the outcomes are not equally likely as they were in that example we just looked at. They're probably not equally likely there. So our idea is that we are going to develop some basic rules that probabilities should always follow should always follow. So that's what we'll do first. And then we are going to use some probability, some of these probability properties that follow from those basic rules to compute probabilities. Okay, to compute probabilities. All right, and we are going to study experiments where we have some advanced knowledge about the outcomes. Oops, sorry, advanced knowledge about the outcomes. Okay, so we are ready at this point to define uh, what a probability measure is and state some of the basic rules that a probability measure should always follow. All right, so this definition will say that a probability measure a probability measure assigns a number referred to as a probability to each event E of a sample space. And the probability measure must satisfy the following what are called axioms. Axioms. Okay, so these are going to be three basic rules that probabilities need to satisfy. Okay, so the probability of some event E is always going to be greater than or equal to zero or less than or equal to one. So this needs to be true for any 
event E. So we've seen that this was the case when we had equally likely outcomes that a probability is always between 0 or 1 and, and it could be equal to 0 and it could be equal to 1. But, and so we're stating that that needs to be true in any situation when we have a probability measured. Okay, so the second axiom is that the probability of the whole sample space needs to be 1. In other words, it's guaranteed that some event in the sample space will occur because the sample space is everything. Okay, so, and the final uh, axiom is that if A and B are disjoint events, then if we look at the probability of A union B, it's going to be equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. And that's really similar to what we've seen before when counting the number of elements in disjoint sets. Okay, so I think these are all properties that we'd kind of expect for a probability measure to have. All right, so now that we've stated these, let's do some short examples. So example one asks, which of the following can't, cannot be probabilities? So part A is saying the number one third. Okay, so with one third, this can be a probability. And it can since one third is a value that is between zero and one. That's one of the conditions that we need a probability of some event to have. Okay, so for these remaining ones, B, C, and D, I wanna give you the opportunity to try them. So pause the video. These should be pretty quick, hopefully. Pause it just for one minute to try the remaining ones. Four, three, two, one, pause the video. Pause it for one minute to try B, C, and D. Alrighty, so hopefully you paused it and tried those for a minute. Let's talk about them together. So B is talking about the number pi. So pi is approximately equal to 3.14. So seeing that, we notice that, wait, pi is definitely bigger than one. And a probability, according to axiom number one, can't be bigger than one. It's gotta be less than or equal to one. So it can't. Pi can't be a probability. All right, part C says zero. So the number zero can be a probability since it does satisfy this first condition since the number zero is greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one. So notice in particular that zero is less than or equal to zero. This is, this part of the inequality is true because we do have the equal sign. All right, let's look at D. So we have a negative number here and a negative number is definitely not going to work because a negative one third is less than zero. So it's not going to satisfy this first condition. So this can't be a probability. In fact, any negative number can't be a probability. All right, let's do another example. So example two says, let A and B be disjoint with the probability of A being equal to 0.3 and the probability of B being equal to 0.45, find the probability of the union of A and B occurring. Okay, so it's helpful, just like when we talked about sets and the number of elements in a set, to be able to visualize questions like this with a Venn diagram. So I'm gonna visualize this with a Venn diagram. Even though it's possible to do this without a Venn diagram, I think it's just helpful in terms of visualizing. Okay, so I'm gonna draw a circle for the event A. And because these are disjoint, I'm also gonna draw a circle for the event B. But the circles should not overlap because they are disjoint uh, events. So I'm gonna draw these occurring inside of this rectangle, which I'll label as U for my universal set. But in this case, my universal set is my sample space. So I could also call this S if I wanted to. S is the set of all possible outcomes. 
Okay, and it tells me that the probability of A is 0.3, so let's write a 0.3 in the circle. The probability of B is 0.45, so let's write 0.45 in this circle. And I could see kind of conceptually from the Venn diagram that if I want to find the probability of the union of the two, I should just be adding these two numbers straight up. And that's exactly what probability three, sorry, axiom three says. If my events are disjoint, and I want to find the probability of being in the union of the two events, I add the two probabilities. Okay, so let's do that as well. So this is going to be equal to probability of A plus probability of B since A and B are disjoint. The probability of A is 0.3. The probability of B is 0.45. And if you add those together, we get 0.75, and that's our answer. So the next video, one of the things that we will do is talk about, well, how can you find the probability of a union when the two events are not disjoint? And that will be really similar to a formula that we've seen before for the sizes of sets.